probably just as well. <laughs> Besides, you got me in a living color. I mean, how can it get any better than that? <laughs> Want to do a test? Are, are we good? Hello, hello, hello. Test, 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 test. One, two, three, three, two, one. Testing. Hello, hello, hello. Sounds like someone can hear us on Facebook. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Streaming always is. Start again. I get nervous with the microphone and she wants me to start again. I'll get to that. Uh, good evening and thank you for coming uh, to Inventors from Spencer, uh, a part of the Historic Preservation Month which takes place each and every May. Uh, we need to thank the following people, and that would be the Spencer Chamber of Commerce, Historic Preservation Commission, SMU, the City of Spencer, the State of Iowa Library, and the Clay County Heritage Center. I'm Tom Howe, and before I introduce tonight's speaker, I would like to share just a few inventor facts which I discovered in going through this wonderful sheet that Dave Schaefer came up with or for me or whatever for our, for our commission. Uh, at any rate, there are, when, when this thing started, I thought, how can we have anybody besides Walter Thomas uh, as an inventor and Spencer? Well, I was one or two off. We have 344 patents for Spencer residents, which is really amazing. Um, the first patent in Spencer was issued uh, to a gentleman by the name of James Hart, and he is not a relative, but uh, he invented a fence and somehow got, I don't know how you get a patent on a fence, but he did. And, uh, but that was in 1878, and since that date through 2020, uh, makes the total of 344. Uh, of those 344 patents, 128 have been primarily for plants and seeds of hybrid corn varieties, and that's the way they list it. Uh, and the majority of those patents belong to Christopher Souter. But we were looking for inventors of stuff that, stuff, I guess would be the best word. Um, and tonight we have the pleasure, we were to hear from Carl Nolan who has the most patents uh, in Spencer. And due to a family emergency, uh, he was unable to be here tonight. And that's where we got Dave Schaefer uh, to speak on an invention and a patent that he holds. And then we are lucky enough to have John and Jeff Thomas. And in case you missed it, they are twins. Uh, <laughs> but their grandfather, Walt, uh, it had nine inventions primarily to do with the automobile industry. And uh, the fun thing was, for me, is that all of a sudden their dad, Tom Thomas, had five. And I think they're going to talk on both, both patents and uh, the inventions that, that those people had. But uh, before I turn the floor over, just maybe a couple things more. Um, Maybe not. Well, one thing I, that I found kind of interesting is that there were five women that had patents. So, it, you know, you think of the inventors and these guys sitting in a smoke-filled room or doing whatever. But, um, and I thought, because I knew at least one of these ladies, and I thought probably somebody in this room would know several others. But Ardeth Mateer, in 1986, uh, designed a vehicle visor device. Peggy Rose, a haystack feeder apparatus in 1974. Janet Dean in 1991 for a child's toilet seat. 
Uh, Vanessa Cook had three, and she was also in on the plants and seeds of the corn variety. And finally, Katherine Johnson in 2013 for a crevice collar. I have no idea what a crevice collar is. Can anybody help me out? But uh, I thought those were rather interesting there. Um, they, they call it crevice. Um, and according to this sheet, which is really right, uh, <laughs> and before you leave this evening, uh, I wanted to show something that the blue notebook on the end of the table uh, came from John Bang, uh, whose grandfather, Nil C. Bang, invented a lot of stuff. Uh, and you look at that, you'll see that. But I thought it was interesting that he only had one patent. And that patent he co-did with a gentleman by the name of F.A. Howe. Uh, and Fletcher Howe happened to be my grandfather. And he was a jeweler in Spencer. But <laughs> Fletcher and Nils Bang uh, designed a cleaner for a rake. I suppose when you fill it up with leaves, this was some kind of a device that hooked onto a rake and you could push them off without having to drag the leaves off, but no clue. I had no idea. My grandfather did have three more inventions because he uh, and his brother owned Howe Brothers Jewelry and in the late 20s sold it to a gentleman by the name of Ralph Nelson. And the rest is history. So I think without any further ado, allow me to introduce John and Jeff Thomas, and if you'll tell us about your family's inventions. Thanks, guys. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for coming. I want to preface my information here with the understanding that this is stuff that is a hundred plus years old. So when I was born, all of these things that my grandpa, Walter Heathcote Thomas, had invented, patented, sold, and everything, it was old news by the time I was old enough to even know what was going on. We have no real hard objects to show you of his main invention other than some sketches that he used when he went around selling these things or sent to the dealers that were selling them. So there's a picture here that gives you about as close of an idea of what he called at the time a bulldog foot accelerator and I'll try to explain all that in coherent order. So 1908 was when Henry Ford started putting out Model T Fords. They came off the assembly line with hand-controlled gas accelerators. M many of you have driven tractors, even in the 50s and 60s, still had hand controls. So all, the, and, and he sold millions of them, millions of cars, these Model Ts. So we got all these people running on the roads that are shifting steering and running the gas control with one hand well with one hand right hand it took some dexterity and a, and a coordinated effort to do this well I would assume especially if you were a new driver so because and if and if you think about oops let me lose that the uh, thing I wanted you to think about, those of you that have driven tractors that had these hand accelerators, when you were driving them and you gave it gas and you let up, did the gas ever slowly go back down? The, the skid plate mechanism sometimes would wear out and get smooth so the lever would come back spring loaded. Or the spring itself was either too tight or not tight enough so it might just stay stuck somewhere or slowly slip back. So you're constantly shoving the gas accelerator back up while you're trying to drive and steer and all that stuff. So thus the need for this eventual invention that I'm going to talk about. Invention. Okay, so there's millions of these cars out there and there's all kinds of people, backyard mechanics, shops, individuals that are noticing this inconvenience and they start making their own foot accelerators. 
So instead of having hand control, they move it down to the floorboard so they can do this with their foot while they're driving. So there's numbers of these things out there and around after 1908. I don't know how soon after that. And guys would get together and make new units in their shops and their garages and put them on their cars and drive around town. And hey, that worked pretty well. You want one in your friend's car? And that's kind of what happened. Now there's other, there's multiple versions to this story, but somehow or another, my grandpa, Walter Heathcote Thomas, and some associates of his put some of these in their cars and other people's cars and they worked really well. And, and they knew about some of these other models that were out there, I assume. And who, who knows what happened? All I know is, is that grandpa had the notion that this had potential. And he's the one who took it and refined it and patented it and got the patent for it. Now the engineering of that thing was apparently pretty good because it worked well. And, and the patent of course was critical. But the real big story to this is the marketing. He took this thing and before he got the patent on the foot accelerator, he patented a trademark called the Bulldog. Just the picture, not the writing below it. So he got this trademark, this bulldog, and he put that bulldog name and picture on every one of those, these things that I'm going to tell you about he sold. And everything else he invented also got the name bulldog. And it became a recognized name, and it helped sell the rest of the things that he did. He had a pet bulldog. And somewhere in, in his collection, he had a bulldog statue that sat on the floor and was used as a doorstop. But we don't know if that was a relic of the real guy or not. I don't even know what his name was. Probably Bulldog. <laughs> they started monkeying around with this design somewhere between 1914 and 1918. So eight, seven, eight years after, six, eight years after the uh, Model T's came out. Anyway, so he, he patented it. He called it the Bulldog Foot Accelerator for Fords because that's what it was originally made for. And um, he marketed this all over the world, wherever Fords were sold, and they were sold all over the world at this time. He marketed to customers. He marketed to dealers. He marketed to mechanic shops. All of his marketing addressed different levels of the, of the population that would eventually end up with this, which was, you know, pretty, pretty encompassing. He would send places like H&N Chevrolet, that didn't sell Fords back then, they weren't even in business then, countertop mock-up models of his invention. And that mock-up model would have a, a write-up on it that would tell you the cost, how to self-install it so that the, the dealers and the mechanic shops didn't have to take time selling this thing. He sold it for them if they wanted one of these mock-up things. And speaking of that, the cost of this thing, which I have no model of, just a picture, was $1.50. The, I did a presentation on this four or five years ago, and he, in the writings, it comes out that he spent over $50,000 a year marketing this product to sell a product that cost a dollar fifty and was split between the dealers and him that means he had to sell thirty four thousand of them a year just to pay for his marketing but he knew i guess this was going to pay off and, and apparently it did so i think the marketing was what made it so successful so Henry Ford sold millions of cars. Walter Heathcote Thomas sold millions of Bulldog foot accelerators. And people could still use their hand accelerators if they wanted to. The thing that he had would, instead of having this hand control, it was in the floor, so you just pushed your foot on this button, that was the accelerator. It could easily be mounted by people themselves. So a lot of them were putting them in their cars. When 1927 rolled around, and what else came out then? The Model A, which was a little fancier car, 
but apparently the engine and the things that they made and put inside it was the same, so they could use the same foot accelerator for the Model A. So it just sales continued for them. His patent was good for 17 years, which would have taken him up into the early 30s. But somehow, somewhere in 1920s or later, Ford developed their own foot accelerator and started installing them in them when they came off the, off the production line. And uh, Grandpa's sales just kind of slowly dwindled because he was left with the people that had wanted an aftermarket product. Now, his manufacturing plant I'm going to point to Tom. This thing won't just stay up here. I'm sorry. I'm going to point to Tom again because Tom is involved with H&N &H Chevrolet, and my grandfather's manufacturing plant was on that same block of town. It was kitty corner from the Hy-Vee liquor store now. That vacant parking lot that they use for cars, that's where his manufacturing plant was. And it was a block away from the railroad. Every Thursday or Friday, I heard the story, they'd load up a truck full of boxes of stuff going all around the world and take it down to the railroad station and ship it off. Okay. His whole operation was closed down somewhere in the mid-1930s. They were opened in 1920 or so and done by the 30s. All right, let's move on to the next topic. This was the, I think I showed you that, didn't I? The bulldog picture that he used on everything. All right, so what happened, and I have models here of some of the things. What happens in that same time frame, Grandpa did not just sit and run this shop. He invented numerous other things. Again, putting that bulldog label on him, which had become so well known and, and for quality, and it just seemed to work. He upgraded that accelerator anywhere from one to four times. I cannot tell, and I do not know. There's, there's like four foot accelerator things listed in the patent list. So I don't know how that worked or what it happened. In 1926, he patented a specific foot pedal for the accelerator. There was just a button on the floor you could push, then he adapted a hinge thing that had a whole foot thing. And he invented, or patented, I should say, improved foot pedals for all the other pedals in the floor, the clutch and the brake and stuff. That had little raised edges on them, so your foot wouldn't slide off when you went to push on it. And he marketed all this as safety features and comfortable foot contact with the rubber pads on it. So really, it was kind of a safety feature, but it was just one more thing he did under the Bulldog name that sold very well. Every, everything he packaged got one of his Bulldog stickers on it. You know, it went around the world in boxes with that bulldog showing. I don't know what language they put it in over there, but all over. But In addition to those foot pedals, he invented what he called a three-way carburetor control. This box is 100 years old or so, and it's fallen apart on me. So if you come up here and look at this, don't handle the box. This is just part of what he did with the carburetor control. It had a real unique little mechanism in here that allows you to push the button or pull it so it fully primes the carburetor, the, the choke thing, and then you can fine tune it by turning the knob and it'll stay right where you leave it. It wouldn't slowly creep up or down or change on you. And that was mounted on the dash, right? I'm not a mechanic, so some of this I don't know any more than that. And somewhere, also in the 1920s, we have a different version of this, apparently from our sister who talked to Jeff today. In the literature that I read years ago, it says he invented a rear fender stabilizer for Fords. The Fords had you know, metal fenders over the wheels, and, you'd, and the roads were not good, so you'd drive along, rattle, 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 rattle. And he invented just a bar that connected the two back fenders so that they wouldn't rattle so badly. Whether it was served as a bump or two, we don't know. Now, Jeff's story is that he also invented some kind of um, rear bar for a tractor or something to keep it from tipping backwards. And he thought maybe that was the Ford stabilizer, but we, I don't know for sure. And I tell you, this stuff didn't get on the internet. Um, not that they would have done me any good anyway, but. I did try to look some of these things up, like the stabilizer bar, and there's, there's, all, it's all, there's all kinds of stuff in there, but not having anything to do with way back in the 1920s and 1930s. 
So th this is what we have right here is really the history of it. I don't I don't have much more. Um, I don't think I have anything more to mention to you. There is stuff up here, some of the original pat patent copies, a picture of the manufacturing plant, all the little things that he'd put his symbols on and boxes. If you want to look at them, you may. But thank you for listening in. Well, we're going to go from the serious stuff to what I'm calling the Brady Bunch patent <laughs> story of the Thomas family. Can I move this stuff? Thanks, Tom. That's all right. Want your glasses? I might need those. No. Um, just to give you an idea, as John said, all of Grandpa's stuff happened before we were even born. It happened before we were even born. But my father, who obviously grew up in Grandpa's household, kind of had the inventor bug because he saw what wonderful results it could produce. And uh, by the way, I had a quick story. I talked to a friend of mine whose dad, or Grandpa, was a friend of our Grandpa. And he said that he was given the opportunity to invest in the Bulldog right at the inception when he wanted to go patent it. And it was like a $500 investment. Um, he, did, he chose not to at the time because he either didn't have the funds or didn't think it was worthwhile. But apparently there was an opportunity to get on the ground floor of the bulldog process back then. Anyway, my dad kind of got the bug that maybe he could do this sometime, although he was raising six kids and trying to keep a business afloat. And so he didn't really get started uh, with his inventing stuff, I think, until we were probably in grade school. And all of his little projects that he got interested in and uh, spent time on seem to stem from just the modern day-to-day -day stuff that our family was doing. It all related to the activities of the kids or just something around the house, just the obvious stuff, which that's where most inventors get started too, but his were pretty mundane at times and I'll um, start in with that. But some interesting, at the time he was doing some of this, and this was back in probably the 80s, my brother was doing a little analysis about just the cost of getting a patent, a simple patent, not anything as complicated even as the bulldog probably. Um, and the approximation back then through an attorney up in Minneapolis was about $8,000 for the whole process. And that got you nothing more than the patent. Obviously, it didn't get you the marketing effort and it didn't get you a big paycheck. It just got you the rights to exploit it to the best of your, best of your ability. And the timetable to get one was about three years. So anyway, as you can imagine with six kids and three, I have some diagrams here. There were three teenage or almost teenage daughters in the house and a lot of hair rollers floating about the house, <laughs> especially in our bathroom. And there's some question about what all was available on the market at the time, but most of you ladies will remember the little bristle rollers wrapped in wire and netting, and you roll it up and stuck a pin in it and slept on it all night long. Oh. So there was obviously lots of complaints about that in the household, and so Dad took it upon himself to try and figure out a better hair roller. And he came up with a concept that was, this is actually a, one from modern times, or more modern, but it was very similar to this one. He put a plastic tube, he wrapped it in spun, or f uh, foam, and then he built a little flexible, and again, much like this one, a little flexible arm that would come up and down and clip on the hair. Now, I wasn't involved. We weren't his guinea pigs for that. Our sisters and our mother clearly was. And I asked them, I said, well, how come that didn't go? I said, they got stuff around now that works like that, and they all just said, you know what, just... It didn't fit right, it didn't, it didn't handle a lot of hair because there wasn't room for it. Um, and I think maybe they just got tired of being guinea pigs. But anyway, <laughs> excuse me, I have a cold so I'm kind of dry in the mouth. Anyway, I'm practicing my little presentation here today in front of my partner, Jana Lorenz, and I said, well, yeah. And she said, well, what was this roller like? And I was explaining it to her and showing my simple little sketch here. And she goes, well, I've got something just like that back in the closet. And she pulls out a bag of these. And she goes, 
I've had these since I was in junior high. So that would be about the time dad was trying to work on something like this. I have no idea why that wasn't apparent to him, or maybe it was just shortly after that that something like that got created. But I know he had enlisted the services of, was it the Larson School of Hairstyling? I think he had, you know, used them as guinea pigs and, and for sound uh, feedback. Um, apparently they didn't know about something like that at this point, so that's why he proceeded with his, and he did get a patent on it. But it never sold. But that's the, the uh, answer I have for almost all of these Tommy Thomas patents. He had trouble getting any of them to market, <laughs> unlike Grandpa. Um, and so that was in the 60s when he was working on that. In 1969 and then again in 1971, he got two patents. And I have the actual patent documents here, and you're welcome to browse those, um, on a toilet flushing mechanism. Because there was a lot of toilets getting flushed in our house. And it was always irritating when the tank didn't drain or it kept leaking and refilling and leaking and refilling and dad was feeling the pennies flowing out of his pocket for all of us kids. So he took it upon himself to try and invent a new toilet flushing mechanism. And I was reading the patent um, itself and it explained that the existing systems at that time, which would have been in the late 60s, um, they were more or less permanently attached to the water tank in some way, either to the outlet pipe or the overflow pipe or some other part of the tank. And according to the patent application, it generally required the skill of a plumber to repair it or replace it, and of course that was expensive. And they were also complex enough, apparently, that it wasn't something that just any handyman felt like picking up and doing. So dad was inspired to try and find a way to build a, uh, a, a new unit. And it, th there's a diagram in the paperwork, but it was just literally a, a metal shaft. And at the bottom of it was a, a plastic flotation device that would raise with the water. And it was attached to the triggering arm with just a chain like today's are. But it would rise up and down on this metal shaft. And it was self-sealing at the bottom. It just fit into any ordinary uh, toilet. So you didn't have to go out and buy a different one for every different kind of toilet you had. Apparently they were pretty standard in that way. So you could literally just put it in there with your hand. It was pressure sealed and attach it to the thing and off you go. Well, as I said, that one didn't go anywhere either, but it was self-contained. It fit right into the outlet without any other tools or anything but apparently there was enough competition on the market that there was no, no uh, advantage to pursuing more marketing or spending more money on it, but he had the patent for it. Here's the one bright spot. In junior high, I was, this is the Bob Dean load in. <clears throat> uh, that, at, I was in fifth grade in 1965, and that's when they started recruiting people to start playing in the high school band. And I was apparently going to be the next saxophone virtuoso. I didn't know that, and I didn't feel it. But um, I got enlisted into the band in fifth grade, and I played for a whole of two years before my career fizzled out. But I was playing this woodwind instrument. And f for those of you who aren't familiar with what you got to do with a woodwind, any kind of a clarinet or a saxophone, it has a thin wooden reed that is part of the mouthpiece and you clamp it on freshly every time you go to practice or play and you have to saturate it with your own saliva so it will soften up and vibrate properly. But the problem with that is it also is wet and it's dry and it's wet and it's dry and they weren't terribly expensive but you didn't want to have to keep replacing them all the time. So, and there were reed holders that people used, and most of them, I'm, my understanding is, were used by a little more high profile artists. And they were metal, and therefore they considered them to be very heavy, and they were much more expensive, and you couldn't wash them and you know get the bacteria out of them as well, because they were all welded together and they were 
parts that you couldn't access. So my dad, who was already heavily into plastics with his toilet bowl thing and his hair rollers, <laughs> decided to try and invent um, a plastic reed holder or create one. And he did. And it's a very, very, very simple device. It's got four slots, two on each side, so you can hold four of your reeds in there. And it has a, just the clip on the end that you can take off so you can clean it all. And then you just snap the clip back on. And you're ready to go again. Um, I don't know what the price of this was. Obviously, a piece of plastic like this costs about a nickel. But I do know that he was able, he, he got enlisted with the uh, Brillhart Music Company. They sell a lot of mouthpieces, you know, brass pieces and things like that. And he got in with them, either directly or through an agent of some sort. And they started to manufacture and distribute these. Um, and I... They were not distributed widely, but they did sell some in the United States. And my dad, over the years, told me that the most sales he had were actually over in Europe. And I don't really know how long the sales went on. It was never a real profitable enterprise at all. But I think for a number of years, he continued to get uh, royalties back on sales that had been generated by uh, this company over in Europe. This next, and you can see he was a busy guy. You should have gone down to his basement sometime. He had a, he had a, <laughs> a heck of a workshop down there and all kinds of magnets that he'd cut up and parts and plastic that he had on his little jigsaw cutting into shapes and squares and, yeah, <laughs> we could smell burnt plastic constantly in our house. <laughs> but anyway, this relates to his magnets. Uh, in junior high again, John and I and our big brother Walt, we all started running a little bit of track or participating in track. And uh, for those of you of closer to our age, you remember when the Fosbury flop became very uh, prominent in the sporting world for, for high jumpers. And John and I was actually one of the, I think we were one of the first two that ever started doing that here in Spencer. But anyway, so he would come to the track meets, he'd watch us do the Fosbury flop. And he noticed that, well, before us, traditionally, they called it the Western Roll. And the high jumper would run up to the bar, if you're right-handed, and go over like this and land on their back after making a successful roll. The Fosbury flop was to run up like this and take off on your right leg and go over like that. And it's the only way they do it now. It's the most um, productive way to high jump anymore. But anyway, in watching us perform, he noticed that the, the, the high jump bar was set on two poles. And it rested just on pegs that stuck out from those poles. The pegs were adjustable to raise or lower the bar, depending on the competition. So the competition went on. You had to keep raising it. But they were just these hard metal pegs, and this was a metal bar. And pardon me again, I'm just really dry. And he realized there were many problems with this, actually, because if the bar's just setting on this peg, and the peg's only about that long, the bar's almost as wide as the peg was. If there's a wind blowing, at times, you know, we'd run track in Iowa, there was a lot of wind blowing, it could literally just blow the bar off the peg. And there was nothing more frustrating for me as a high jumper, I remember. You're all set up, you finally get yourself psyched up to go jump over this bar and you get right here and the wind blows it off. And you're like, oh geez, gotta go back and try it again and hope it doesn't blow off next time. And most high school, like major college tracks, I think, and professional plat tracks, they had double runways, different directions, just like a, an airport. If the wind was blowing this way, they could set it up so it wouldn't blow off the stands. If the wind was blowing the other way, they could run, have one pit but two runways. Well, we didn't, high schools usually didn't have that kind of access. So that was a problem. And the other thing was, when you were jumping or pole vaulting, this applies to both, uh, you could hit that bar going up, 
You could hit the bar getting over the top. You could hit the bar when you're coming back down. Anything should knock it off if it's a significant blow. But with these pegs, the bar could literally bounce up quite a ways and unfortunately, in some instances, just come back down and land on the pegs again. Even though you massacred it, you'd get credit for a good jump because it didn't fall to the ground. Now that wasn't fair at all. It just seemed totally in inequitable. So dad came up with the idea of just having the bar suspended with magnets. The magnets would just be mounted on the side of the poles and on one side of the bar and attach, and I've got another real basic drawing here that you won't be able to see from your seats, but it's up here if you want to look at it. But this way, the one, the wind isn't going to knock it off. And if anybody bumps it significantly enough, it's going to fall straight down and it's not going to land on the peg and stay up there. So it's clean. Seems to solve all the problems, except the political ones. There are so many sporting organizations in the world and so many standards that have to be met for high school, college, Olympic level stuff, that there was no way to get this thing approved without going through years of arduous marketing efforts and a lot of money to convince all these organizations to adopt a whole new standard for their high jumping and pole vaulting equipment. So that just hit a dead end, even though I think that was one of his better ideas over the years. And, f well, not finally, we got, are you gonna talk about that? Time? Okay. Um, the f <laughs> I don't know who in the family was the worst snorer. I don't know if anybody was. Maybe it was mom, but it prompted dad to decide that maybe he could invent an anti-snoring device. You want, well, you don't want to buy one of these. <laughs> I have a, it's an old picture, here. I actually got sucked into, uh, trying out one of these. This is a picture of me, I don't know, probably, this was in 1997 when he got this patent. And this is not the actual version that he patented, but this is just me coming home from college or Minneapolis, wherever I was. And hey, we Jeff, come on down, I want you to try this on and sleep with it tonight. <laughs> well, I did. I didn't sleep, but I tried it. <laughs> he was convinced that to prevent snoring, all you had to do is keep somebody's mouth shut or all you had to do is keep their tongue compressed or depressed down. Now, to our knowledge, there was no medical or other scientific evidence that this was the reason for snoring. Um, but there were many anti-snoring devices on the market and patented already that thought the same thing. So dad decided to devise the most comfortable, effective one he could and he went through many, many iterations of this particular one. He does have, where is that paperwork? He did finally patent one, and you're, again, you're gonna have trouble seeing it from here, but it, it's, a, it's a mask of sorts. It would sit on the, your face, like this, and strap around the back of your head, and then it had a hole that you could breathe through, and then it had a flexible tongue depressor. And the tongue depressor was designed with a certain amount of flexibility so that it held your tongue down off the roof of your mouth, but in the patent application you'll read it says, but still allow normal bodily functions which they said was swallowing, coughing, or sneezing. So it had kind of a double flexible uh, job there. I don't know how to say it other than, yeah, it was another failure. It didn't go anywhere. <laughs> and I don't know if any of these other devices that were on the market at the time ever went anywhere either. But um, when you have to spend that much money on a patent, which he did, and then try and go market it, 
you know, grandpa's example, $50,000 a year, it, it just, it wasn't worth pursuing many, many, many of these uh, items. Although, you never know. Sometimes one little thing will happen and pop and some manufacturer, for example, would come along and say, hey. And there are, there are people that, big organizations that do that. They scour the patent records to look for something that is out there but hasn't been marketed or exploited yet. And they'll go to the person and say, we, we like your idea, we want to buy it and multiply it and make money off it. So um, that's, whoops, I licked the microphone instead of my finger. <laughs> that's the last of uh, the Tommy Thomas devices, except for this one right here. And John, if you want to take it away, go ahead. This was also, a, I think, a wonderful device. It was ahead of its time. If you go to Menards and look at their toilet flushers, by the way, you know, they're in those blister packs that you need a heavy-duty shears to open up. Those new flushing devices look almost identical to Dad's prototypes way back when. Somewhere along the way, Dad got some lake property, and he had a boat and a dock. And back then, what they used for boat bumpers was, anybody know? Black tires. They were heavy. They didn't blow away, but they were heavy, they were ugly, and they would mark up your boat. Yeah, they'd have water trapped in them, so you'd always get so dad came up with this idea right here and it's we actually sold some of these i walked around the lake one one time and stopped at every place i could and sold some of these for him he called them boji bumpers he did not patent this by the way so sorry we're taking your time here but it's just made out of ethafoam he put a little sailboat signal on it he's got some um braided nylon rope that it's, that he'd, he'd he'd do this by hand he'd get a hot rod and he'd melt through that and he'd put a grommet in there and he'd run that rope through it and he bought special little plastic hooks and he made a tie down system that doesn't release once you tie it down. That had potential but he just just never just never went with it like a lot of other stuff. I think that's all folks. Thank you. This? Um, it was in the 70s or 80s when he made this, yeah. And there were a few around the lake. You might have seen them. Yes. Well, one problem with it was it only worked on pretty much on square posts, and a lot of the posts now are small metal posts, and you just couldn't. His system just didn't accommodate tying it tight to a, those newer models. So. Is it flexible just at all? Or it's hard. It's real dense at the foam, they call it. <clears throat> Any other questions? Or don't be afraid to, I don't know when they're going to have time for that, but. I can tell you that these two said, you know, we probably will take five minutes and uh, then we're going to be out of anything to say. Well, thank you, gentlemen. It was great. Really well done. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Carl Nolan, who has uh, 10 patents uh, as late, his first one, I believe, was in 1959 and his last was in 2020. And it, who knows if he has something in 2021. Knowing Carl, he probably does. But uh, the Nolans came up with a family emergency, and so we thought, well, who else could do this on short notice, and uh, why not a member of the commission who we know has a patent, uh, and it's an interesting story how he did it. So with no further ado, uh, here's Dave Schaefer to explain this machine that none of us will ever understand, but it works. Thank you. Well, I'm Dave Schaefer. I'm a member of the Historic Preservation Commission, electronic technician, certified traffic technician, inventor, published author, and I've been called lazy because I always look for an easy way to do a difficult job. One of my favorite sayings is, there's got to be a better way. 
That was the title of an article that I wrote, which was published in the IMSA Journal in June of 1998. And IMSA is the International Municipal Signal Association, so that article went worldwide. Um, let me give you a little background of a traffic control system. I should have a whiteboard or something, but I'll just use my hands. Every intersection that has a traffic light has a cabinet, which contains a controller that controls turning the lights off and on and timing for how long each light stays lit. There's also a conflict monitor that ensures that the lights controlling the movement of the traffic will not cause a collision. These two pieces of equipment are all wired to a back panel where the red, yellow, green, and walk lights all are hooked up and they get their power. All of this must be working properly to provide safety for the motorist as well as the pedestrian. I just completed work in a cabinet in Fargo, North Dakota that had been wired so that the conflict monitor could allow green indications in every direction at the same time without putting the intersection in flash. That's what the monitor is supposed to do. If you have conflicting greens, it goes to flash immediately. This one was wired up so it would not go. After several hours of rewiring, it was safe to trust that their conflict monitor would put the intersection to flash and it was obvious that the cabinet had never been tested properly and could have been a huge liability for the city and the state. Next stop was North Dakota DOT and Bismarck. There's got to be a better way was also the consensus of the meeting that I had with the North Dakota DOT in Bismarck in February of 1995. We were discussing cabinet level conflict monitor testing or rather the lack of testing. Manufacturers of conflict monitors recommended testing yearly, some every six months. Test procedures involve turning on each walk, green, or yellow light that's being used one at a time, and then turning on every other walk, green, or yellow output also once at a time to make sure that the conflict monitor recognizes it and will put the intersection in flash. In addition to conflict, a red failure, which is no output at all, that's when the intersection is totally dark. The conflict monitor should shut the thing off and go to, to flash. Uh, there's also a controller voltage monitor and a 24 volt failure that also need to be tested. The field tests are often neglected because of the involved procedure, the possibility of electrical shock, difficulty in accessing the field terminals, which quite often are about six inches off the ground, way in the back of a cabinet, which makes it extremely difficult to get at. Uh, so they can use that or any other number of excuses for not doing it. However, these tests are vital to ensure the proper operation of the back panel and the conflict monitor. Proper testing and record keeping could minimize time in court during litigation. There's got to be a better way kept running through my mind as I drove back from Bismarck to Spencer. And I've been accused of being lazy because I always look for an easier way to get a job done. Anyway, 540 miles later down the road I was, and a lot of scribbles on a notepad, I was back in Spencer and I had an idea. Some of the things to be considered was, of course, the conflict test, making sure it would work properly. Controller voltage monitor, 24 volt test, and the monitor reset is a button on the front of the monitor. Well, if you have to reach for that all the time, that's also an inconvenience. So the tester needed to have a reset right on the tester itself. Um, the uh, it needs to be small size, rugged, eliminating any shock hazard, low cost, easy to operate, and easy to operate. Someone else, uh, I said easy to operate twice because if it's easy enough to operate, somebody else is going to want to do it. That's that lazy streak in me again. Drawings became more precise and I've got a bunch of drawings over here if anybody's interested, uh, they can go through those. Uh, uh, printed circuit boards were designed and parts were ordered and by April the construction was completed. Testing was done and the idea was a reality. 
During the testing, a few minor changes were made to enhance the usefulness of this diagnostic tool. In addition to the original test I thought necessary, it will also test the NEMA plus features, such as minimum clearance, that's when it's, it can't go from green to red without going through at least 2.7 seconds of yellow. Well, that's nationwide, that's an international thing. So if it goes from green directly to red, the intersection should go to flash. That machine will do it. Well, you can test that. Um, also, uh, the watchdog, which if the controller dies, the watchdog is, which is a, is not the bulldog. It's a, a, it's just a square wave, and if it stops going low and high, the monitor sees that and will put the intersection in flash. So it doesn't sit there with the same light showing continuously until somebody comes along and turns it off. So, and then. Uh, Greener walk versus red, which is a confusion, and uh, yellow or green walk or red versus, or green walk or yellow versus red is also a confusion. It was about this time we started to get excited. My boss said, I think you're onto something. That's when we contacted a patent attorney to explore the possibilities of patent and production. The patent was issued a year later and we were in production. The project was named NEMA Cabinet Monitor Tester. <coughs> This is the actual product, still being used today, uh, invented back in, uh, what did I say, 98, and uh, I had to do a little begging to get uh, general traffic to loan this to me for the day, so uh, I could show you folks what it was all about. Uh, it'll work on all TS1 cabinets, which is traffic standard number one. Uh, because the NEMA, the National Electronic Manufacturers Association, defined the pinouts for these three plugs. They're all identical no matter what brand of controller it is. It'll work with this. Um, and I finished up my article by saying I hope this article will make some other people quit saying there's got to be a better way and inspire them to make the way better for all of us. After publishing the article I just read, the folks at the IMSA Journal sent me a plaque as an award for excellence in journalism. It's laying over there on the table. Gee, uh, I never took journalism in high school, so this was something entirely new for me. I didn't take speech either, so uh, standing up in front of a group of people is uh, probably something uh, many years ago I wouldn't have even thought about. So. Um, Anyway, the uh, plaque was really nice because I really like attaboys. They, they're really liked. Um, after the prototype was built, I organized all the steps that I had to go through, all the hoops that I had to jump through into a journal. This book, uh, I, in this book, I keep track of all the things that we had to do, all the little processes that we had to do, the things we had to change to make this thing of reality. Um, everything is in there from the concept to hiring a uh, patent attorney in Des Moines to uh, going through all the things we had to go through, meeting with them to explain how this worked and how it was different from two or three other things they thought was close, but it really wasn't. Um, so anyway, everything is in my uh, journal that I have here. One of my first sales calls was to the city of Bismarck. I asked the signal tech if they did monitor testing. He said they had done one just that morning. It required two police officers to direct traffic, one person to record the tests being made, one person to reset the conflict monitor after each test, and one person, the signal tech, was laying on his belly on the ground with a jumper cable from 120 volts to the green light over here and then another clip wire from 120 volts to every other terminal to see if the conflict monitor would work properly. And after he shorted it and the intersection went to flash, the guy pushing the button would reset the monitor. The guy that was keeping track of the tests over here was writing everything down so they had a record. It only took him two hours to do that one intersection. I showed him my box 
I said, what would you think if I could do that same cabinet in four minutes or less? And he said, you're kidding me. He had a cabinet right there in, the, in his shop. I hooked it up and I ran through every test in less than four minutes. He reached for the telephone, dialed a number and said, I need a purchase order. How much is it, Dave? <laughs> it was just that quick. Uh, North Dakota DOT also purchased one. Now, there is a uh, little thing on this. I, I can appreciate the patents that never went anywhere. Uh, this tester became my favorite diagnostic tool while working for general traffic controls because I could recreate any combination of signal outputs to verify if the problem really did exist and I could see what had to be done to fix it. The tester is hooked up to the cables that normally went to the controller, so using the tester would remove the controller from the equation. And it reminded me of the Chinese battle theory, divide and conquer. If I can eliminate that part of it, and the problem is still here, it's on that. If the problem is gone, it's over there, so it made it real easy. The caveat on this was that a short time after we started production on this thing, NEMA introduced the traffic standard number two, which was a completely different operating system. Sales dwindled, but those that have the tester can and still use this thing today. Like I said, I had to kind of do a little begging to get general traffic to give, give this one up for the day. So anyway, it's uh, <clears throat> I didn't get rich on it. So I understand the uh, frustrations. Uh, had I thought of this 10 years earlier, it might have been a little different story, but uh, that's just the way things are. So thank you for listening. And yes? So is this compatible with any? Any, or, I mean, any TS1 cabinet in any town, any manufacturer, <coughs> as long as it had the, the TS1 designation, the pin out on these three plugs was exactly the same. Uh, most of them at the time that this was uh, put together. Uh, there was one competition, it was a 170 cabinet, uh, which they used in Des Moines and uh, Omaha uh, and a few other places, but almost every cabinet had uh, the TS1 standard equipment in it at, at the time that I thought of this. So, and it was a, a matter of uh, that 540 miles and scribbling down notes that really got this thing off the ground. So, anyway, thank you for listening. Okay. Any other questions? It did. From yes, yes. Uh, the patent that we got was $1,700. I don't think that included the lawyer's fees. Uh, I have a copy of the patent over here. I don't have the original. The original's in the picture here, and it has that nice little scroll on it that uh, I noticed on one of yours. It had uh, a little emblem with ribbons coming from it. Uh, it's in there in the, in the photo. Uh, but yeah, it was... Uh, originally, the patent was turned down, and they reworded some of the application, and it just sailed right through. There was no no question after that. So, but yeah, it was about a year from the time we started until we had the patent in our hands. So, yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Any idea how many you sold? Somewhere around thirty. I don't know exactly. Yeah, yeah. I did have inquiries from Florida and Arizona, and otherwise it was mostly in the in the Midwest, Ohio, and a few other places. But uh, all the places that I did service work, the towns that I did service work in, I'd take it in, and they'd say, "What's that thing?" And uh, so we didn't didn't really actively go out and promote it, but they'd see it and they'd say, "Wow, that's kind of cool. How much is it?" I think I want one. So, anyway, if thousand dollars. So, any other questions? If not, 
my design studio. Yeah. Oh, that, that was all the scribbles on the notepad as we're driving back from, as I'm driving back from Bismarck, uh, going down the interstate and, and taking notes. I didn't save the notes, but I have everything recorded in the journal, that, uh, things that I had thought up as we're coming down. Uh, but it, uh, it was a very useful product. It still is for uh, the older traffic control cabinets, uh, still TS2 or TS1. Uh, and like I say, their general traffic still using it as a diagnostic tool today. So anyway, we're past our hour. Thank you so much for listening. Turn it back over to Tom. Thanks, Ed. Awfully kind of him to jump in at the last moment and save Bob Rose. Uh, all sorts of humiliation. He would have had to get up and talk about one of his inventions, and I'm not sure where we would have gone with that. <laughs> Well, I'm kind of a f fan of the Big Bang Theory, and uh, we have fun with flags with Sheldon Cooper, and uh, I would like to invite you all back next week uh, for uh, family businesses uh, in Spencer, and we just found out tonight that Mark Carey is going to speak on Ed's Radio Ray, uh, also known as Carey Electronic, but when I knew it, it was Ed's Radio Ray, and uh, uh, we've got Tim Steffen will be here talking about everything that the Steffen family has done in the furniture business uh, and their moves from downtown Spencer from one end of the block to the other. Of course, then Tim went back and bought the rest of the block or something. I'm not quite positive, but uh, we really do thank you all for coming. And as I said, uh, you can look at, at the things here that, that Dave has brought, that Jeff and Tom or Jeff and John have brought, and uh, look forward to seeing you all next week. Thanks, everybody.